Science, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. He is a mechanical engineer having masters in science from Bits Pilani. He is well versed with preliminary and detailed design of airframe components and assemblies. He has been associated with fuselage part sizing as per the flight and ground loads application. He also involved in structural layout such as metallic and composite in inboard studies and digital markup of analysis of fuselage. Period two, system integration also. He is currently working for our LCA aircraft. Next variant of LCA aircraft and for fifth generation double engine fighter aircraft at Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. Thank you, thank you, sir. Once again, thank you, sir, to accept our invitation. Now you can present your presentation. Yes, sir, you can proceed. Yeah, thank you, Rajeshwari. Thank, thank, you. thank you for such a nice presentation, which you, you have done on behalf of me. Thank you, sir. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening to all the people who have been with us today in the evening to go through this presentation and spending the time for this valuable webinar. Hope you all are doing good under this current pandemic. And so I also thought it is a very nice opportunity to share my uh, what our work we are doing in my company as well as the current scenario which talks about the unmanned aerial vehicles and their applications for especially the military logistics. Let's start with that. Any presentation which I generally brought out in my aeronautical field, I always try to pay tribute to these two gentlemen who are well-versed with our aeronautical society, Mr. Orville and Wilbur. They were the two visionaries who started this aeronautical and aircraft field with their we, uh, we can say it as imaginations, which today we all are working and taking the next leap and the next step in our industry. And then, of course, Mr. Milton Wright, who is a bishop of the Church of the United Brethren in Christ. He was also a legendary guy who worked in the structures and make good uh, can say a good contribution during the early phase of our aerospace and aeronautical industry in general. Now, this is the typical frontline autonomous UAV, which we will try to bring out in this webinar today. As per the category and as per the class, it is basically to lift the logistic supply for our defense forces which is very difficult to meet in the hilly terrain and the border areas, which is under the tight security of our enemy neighbors. Let's start with the today's webinar. Here is a brief introduction of how this field is look around. We all know that UAVs are the future and they are in the current spotlight. There are many applications which make for great headlines, especially two years back when there was uh, infiltration for the uh, to get, remove the terrorists from the soil, and there were U.S. Army which was looking for the hideouts of terrorists. Then there was some relief work in Africa, and in Germany it was for commercial application for parcel delivery. All these specific applications were made achievable by the use of UAVs, or we can call it a drone, small size UAVs. Additionally, there are now a lot of startups, private companies, which have also jumped into the, uh, the last mile connectivity and who are trying to woo the customers for delivering small, small boxes, whether it is textbooks or whether it is some parcel to the last customers. Especially now, if you will see the European pandemic situation, nobody wants to have any contact with the delivery guy. So that is a field where the UAVs will be of great uh, 
benefits. Let us take our Indian scope where the current warlike situation is being developed in the hilly area of Leh and Ladakh. As we all know, there is a lot of surveillance and logistical support required in the hilly and mountainous area, especially the line of actual control, which both the countries are trying to dictate on their own terms. Now, apart from the regular vigilance, there is also a continuous requirement to have the military logistics in place, especially during the winter harvest season. Also, the current government has put up a lot of stress, a lot of emphasis to minimize the casualties or the rescuing the already wounded soldiers. So, we can call it as an opportunity where we can deliver both the requirements by using our UAVs because the traditional approach has been to use helicopters and of course cargo aircraft to airlift as well as airdrop not only our troops but the logistics which keeps them in place like the food, medicines and of course the artillery and ammunition. Now talking in terms for the current scenario which India stands as of now, we have roughly 70 heroes. Now these are the male attack drones which are already proven and we have taken on the commercial shelf purchase by uh, our Israeli counterpart. Now just purchasing from abroad to meet the current requirement doesn't fulfill our long-term ambition of having a control on Eastern Front as well as the Western Front with Pakistan. Now, now our indigenous development, which is already going on with DRDO and Bell, hopefully we all are aware, Rustam 1 and Rustam 2, which are in current design phase, but they have not yet entered into the service. If I will compare with our Chinese counterpart, they are and they are having a very big presence in the UAV. The biggest manufacturers and exporters of UAVs, if you will Google it and try to check, the name will pop up, it is China. Already, People Liberation Army of China, they are using GJ-2, which is a particular version of reconnaissance and strike model. So now, it gives a clear-cut indication where India stands if we compare with the strength of China. Let us take a small case study. We have taken a good study in the lessons of the Afghanistan war. There has been the first successful military test held in 2008. There was a remote control version of Kamen K Max helicopter which was deployed to airlift roughly 6,000 pounds, that is 2,722 mm. kilograms of supply at a time to remote mountainous regions in Afghanistan. Now, if we talk about the units, uh, United States and the NATO forces, any fight in Gulf, whether it is Iraq, whether it is earlier Israeli war, or whether it is Afghanistan war, they want to have a minimum casualties of their forces. So, how to make it sure? That is all through an unmanned aerial vehicle and at a bigger scale, they have converted their already flying KMX helicopter as a manual. So, we, they were very positive with the results. Over a course of two years, this complete mission has completed 1,700 day and night sorties, moving around roughly 30,000 pounds of supplies each day, a total of around 4.5 million pounds of fuel, fuel, ammunition, and of course, medicines. So this clear cut shows that if US is able to have a tremendous positive benefit of using unmanned helicopter in a rough terrain like Afghanistan, then for India, who has a much bigger 
front line border, both with Pakistan and China, we urgently need a similar approach, not only to provide relief to the last mile soldiers, but also to provide relief if any warlike situation happens and we need to bring our soldiers back. Let's take the sea landscape because India also covers a big sea boundary having ocean and a long sea of West, uh, West Bengal. Now here, what we can try to achieve is air cushion landing craft, which are also known commonly as hovercraft. They are very advantageous for sea to have a short movement of equipment. It can have speed over 35 knots with a load capacity of 75 tons, which they do exist as of now. The only challenge in front of us is converting them into an unmanned or autonomous platform. This obviously needs robust technologies, the use of artificial intelligence, but yeah, that is achievable. We have scientists, we have our engineers roughly working into government as well as private MSMEs. So this is much achievable. With this hovercraft deployed on the vast sea line, we can shuttle the troops and even the goods from ships to approximately 25 miles from the shore. And hence we can mitigate the threats from the anti-ship missiles, which we are anticipating that China has already de de deployed along the South China Sea. So to counter that threat, we urgently need to convert some of the existing hovercrafts of our industry into UAVs. Now, it's all talked roughly on the papers, but now once we consider the practical aspects of UAVs, then we need to come into the regulations. Talking about the regulations, these are the guidelines which the government and the government agencies put in place so that the casualties, the damages, the accidents are minimized. Now, since UAVs are much new in our current continent, they play a crucial role in UAVs adoption as well. There soon seems to be a very little common ground on designing effective rules across the borders. So let alone call about the continents. Our regulations vary widely and not only in India, even we have seen the other continents and the countries. These regulations vary from one country to another. Now talking in terms of Indian continent, our Director General of Civil Aviation, that is DGCA, they already have issued draft guidelines on UAS, that is Unmanned Aerial Systems, through their circular, which they call it as requirements for operation of civil, remotely piloted aircraft system, that is RPAS. The intention of the government is quite clear with this. They do want to put in place a regulatory framework in order to encourage the commercial use of drones in areas as diverse as industry monitoring to the disaster management. So we can plainly speak that not only the defense military logistics, even the Indian government is much keen on using the drones for even the civil supplies. So hopefully the draft policy is expected to be soon formalized. There is a team, there is a core team which DGCA has formed and they have included the private as well as government partners. Government partners include people from NL, HL and of course DRTO. So they are jointly working and hopefully very soon we will come up with some guidelines to use drones even in our civil use. Now, declining in the sense of our defense UAVs comes under the umbrella of SEMILEC. SEMILEC is an agency which certifies and clears not only the aircrafts but also the helicopters. Now, the SEMILEC is reviewing the UAV technologies and is yet to release in their guidelines. They have roughly given their DDP mass draft where they have categorized the UAVs 
into three classes. First one is the micro and light UAVs. For them, this class of UAV, the certification is not at all required because we can compare it as a small toy, which we use it for our hobby and try to fix the sensors and cameras and fly it high. Next category is the light UAVs. But of course, in this class, the certification is again required but not mandatory. Now here, the operating speed at full power in level flight is less than 130 km per hour. The impact kinetic energy is again lesser than 95 kJ in both unpremeditated descent scenario and loss of control scenario. Third, Aspect which generally they have covered in their guideline is the range of operation. So for the light UAVs, the range of operation should be within 500 meters. Flying at altitudes, but again, not exceeding 122 meters. So roughly it comes up around, if you talk about the AGA, it is 400 meters. So again, it is mandatory only if it is exceeding 122 meters as per Semilac. The third category, which of course the certification is mandatory, they call it as heavy UAVs. Heavy UAVs means the payload capacity which the UAV is going to pick up and drop to the last line. It has to be exceeding 50 gauges. So, if I'll compare with the other countries, the similar set of guidelines, they are also going through. And since they have to consider the safety, reliability, and of course the quality, since any flying device in the airspace should not come into the direction of the flying civil aircraft. So that is the reason safety is of utmost priority. Because in the recent past, there has been a lot of accidents, a lot of mid-air collisions with a flying UAV, which has accidentally come into the path of flying aircrafts. So, if not the control of the entire aircraft is lost, but of course the performance of the main aircraft after being hit by the UAVs is drastically reduced and there could be a catastrophic failure. Talking about all these regulations being criticized because there is a lobby, even including the humanitarian cause. So even in the US, there is a US $10 billion yearly loss for the economy caused by the overly strict regulations. Because after seeing the safety aspects, US also till now has not allowed the free flying of the drones. So at a time when all the regulatory bodies can, are considered very robust in the US, but still they have to struggle to come up with the proper guidelines. And of course, UAVs will be operating in all types of airspace and sharing this with the commercial aircraft, helicopters and other systems. It could overcrowd in many regions and especially the major cities. Obviously, the air traffic control operations will become a nightmare. The capability, the out of control UAVs is a massive threat, capable of bringing down a big airplane with several hundred passengers on board. Now, a simple example being in 2013, there was an Alitalia pilot who reported he had seen a UAV as close as 200 feet to his plane during his final landing approach to the JF Kennedy International Airport in New York. So this has triggered a lot of panic, a lot of thoughts, questions in the mind of the people who are investigating such kind of cases. And of course, the air traffic controller who has to literally control all the flying motions of the aircraft within their airspace. Now talking about the inherent risks, while railways, trains, ships, and to a lesser extent, the motor vehicles, they follow different rules. UAVs are free to fly anywhere, anywhere. Since they could cause the UAVs to fall even on 
a civil population area. So there is a chance of a system crashing into pedestrians, highways, with the latest sensors on board the UAVs. So even these such accidents can cause big damage. Apart from these regulation aspects, there are public concerns as well. The regulators also need to address the public negative perceptions regarding the UAV. Cameras and other sensors which are attached to the UAVs and are potentially invisible, they could be used for constant surveillance of every action that we people in the society normally do. So notable example is of again a national German railway company, Deutsche Bahn plans, which were planning to use UAV with attached infrared cameras to reduce the graffiti attacks on its property. But this evoked a strong response from the general civilian population because it is worst of dystopian science fiction coming true because many people have given their strong negative sentiments again installing cameras to drones because your privacy is lost. Now, in the Indian scenario or uh, before to the Indian scenario, I just want to quickly cover the different classes which as of now has already been permitted to fly. Some of the UAVs which are multi-copter but they are for taking low altitudes, aerial photos are already been used in the film industry because at some specific height if you want to have a shoot so you can use the drones which are again of lightweight category where certification is not at all mandatory by our similar. Now the technological technological challenges is since any area which is GPS denied environment sometimes due to signal jamming and interference you cannot use such UAVs from the autonomous ground station because you will not be able to send the signals and even you will not be able to receive the signals from your UAV. So anything which is flying without having a control from the ground stations again becomes a nightmare. Then again, coming to point two of the technological challenges, inertial navigation and the accuracies. Based on the experience, like uh, when we are flying our prototypes of UAVs, the accuracy do matters a lot. If you want to position your UAV to land at a particular place, you need to be very clear with the controls. Any farsightedness of the controls will have your vehicle landing at a different place. So that will cause again a distance to your vehicle. And again, there is a need for high wing loading to overcome the strong winds. Then there is an issue of limited endurance due to more power consumption. Then we have a limited payload capacity due to the rare field atmosphere. Now, when I talk about the military logistics, which I am looking and even our defense forces are looking and they want some support from the companies like HAL, NAL, DRDO. So what is the first and foremost thought they do have? The first and foremost thought which any defense person has in his mind is the safety. Any vehicle which is obviously new to their team, coming to their airways, trying to match with the quality and of course the quality safety, reliability of their own air staff systems is again a very big challenge. Challenge in terms of, first of all, is the hilly terrain. You don't have a level space at the last borderline. You just have the air uh, takeoff and landing air strips within the lay area, which is again a part of the city skirts. So that is the reason if you don't have the exact pickup 
and the final takeoff. We call it as a vertical taking and vertical landing uh, feature of the UAV. Unless and until it is proven and matched with 100% guaranteed results, you cannot deliver it to your defense forces. Second thing is the harsh climatic conditions. As we all are aware, as the altitude increases, there is a loss of oxygen level. So if there is less oxygen to burn the fuel, you need to have same quantity of oxygen, either turbo charged or externally supported to carry out the combustion of the fuel so that your propeller, so that your engine works at a high altitude. So considering that kind of a challenge, the UVs which we are building now are slightly advanced or slightly given uh, propulsion wise turbocharge. So when the oxygen supply is bare minimal, aircraft works in that altitude. For that reason alone, multi-copters, vertical takeoff and vertical landing, drones and even the aerial vehicles are used and proposed to our Indian Army. Now, the advantages which our defense forces will try to get out of it is again multidimensional. There will be a minimum risk to their soldiers because soldiers need not to carry their own luggage, their own ammunition, their own food on their shoulders and continue walking to the last mile. In turn, they can look for help by the UAVs because from the remote area inside the Indian subcontinent, these drones, if properly programmed and properly given the inputs, they can carry the suitable payload and drop it to the soldiers' camps. Coming to the second thing, the threat of directly being hit by the enemy or by the enemy drones is also bare minimum because it is the flying small UAS or UAV which is doing all the hardship. It is not the Indian soldiers who have to carry the same kind of thing to the last quarter area. Coming to the third thing, any person because of the harsh weather or because of the rough terrain or because of any enemy engulf, our soldier got wounded. So these flying drones can be slightly modified to have a bench, a kind of a tray. We have a human. We have a human or wounded soldiers could be airlifted, put on the suitable bench and taken inside some uh, where our next immediate hospital is provided. So these are the scenarios which are really studied not only by our India, the Western nations and all the positive feedback outcomes which they have got, we have got the entire parallel synchronous efforts are going on to have more tandem application, more synchronized applications where the UAVs can really work for the benefit of our defense forces at the last mile, that is the last borderline where the connectivity of our uh, defense soldiers with the civil population is also very minimum. Now, this particular slide talks about the defense startups which has already come to some stage because of the continuous efforts by our present government. On March 20, this year, our Raksha Mantri unveiled a draft defense procedure that is DPP 2020 policy. Its aim was described as Make in India, a self-reliant and global manufacturing hub. So one of the categories which introduced above is a simple three-sided procedure for procurement under the make and innovate category. Now, till now, any company who wants to get inside the defense ecosystem to provide some solutions, to provide some software, to provide some uh, test bed, 
that was very difficult to come into the uh, defense at par with the defense uh, procurement policy. Now, with this approach, the idea is to involve the private participation in gaining crucial military and the strategic advantage through generation of innovative technologies and solve their problems, which our defense people faced in their normal day to day work. Now, with this clear cut guideline, any private, suppose it provides software to our uh, controllers, our intelligence systems. It will be very easy for them to come forward, understand our requirements, understand our soldiers pain, and then definitely work to provide some real time solution. Now, the next step which uh, was taken is the Meher Baba competition. It is the Indian Air Force Atam Nirbhar Drive, a DPP Connect, which is open contest on unmanned aerial systems and artificial intelligence usage in humanitarian aid and disaster relief operations. Now, Indian Air Force also has been facing this issue since the last five, six years, because after their continuous efforts, neither within the defense Indian Air Force or whether within the defense companies, they were not getting those kind of solutions or those kind of support, which was really making them strong in the Air battlefield. So, under so many compelling forces and compelling issues, which there were some cross border terrorism as well, they were forced to look into the technology and to look into the uh, aspects which are already present in the country. So, within the country, they come up with some competition where the private universities, government universities, and of course the companies they can have some joint ventures come forward and have some common useful generous provisions to develop common solutions which could be really helpful for them now under this meher baba competition there was a generous provision of providing them funds up to 10 crore rupees to all the successful participants in this competition so on 19th of march this year Startup firm with the name Throttle and done so. They even got the DGC approval to run drone pilot uh, experimental project. Their, their move marked India's first official attempt at allowing long range drone flight. So, some more information on this probably you can get on the website if you will go to the Indian Air Force website and try to put these keywords of Meher Baba competition. You will get the entire list of the categories where the Indian Air Force has invited the private and the universities to come forward with their tested drones, with their tested UAS, UAVs, which can be really developed to the next level by giving some corpus money, corpus aid to them, so that it help them to have a real time solution to fight with the, our enemies. Now, our company, which is again a defense company, we provide the solutions to not only our Indian Air Force, but even our military and the Navy and Coastal Guards. We have been working with them for the last 75 years, now more than that. And now since the approach the scenario of battlefield has totally changed. So it has given us enough information how the battlefield should look like. We have also compared with the similar counter classes of UAVs which are already flying elsewhere in the world. And we also have proposed proposals for the defense forces. So these are the some cases. I mean, these are the uh, some of the projects which we have already been demonstrated, which are also going on currently with them. First one is a mini UAV, which is under 8 kg class. So this is basically for surveillance aspects, which our 
Indian Air Force is looking for. Second one is the Rustam 2, which we are working together with uh, ADE, that is uh, Aeronautical Development Establishment. It is again, partly we have divided the, the work allocation. So HAL is looking after the design and development of structures and the controls engine and uh, the control laws, they are developed by our ADE counterpart. Now, third is again, if you will see the central figure, that is an again unmanned helicopter. It is a two-ton helicopter, which we are trying to convert into a rotary UAV. So the work is undergoing. Uh, and the last one, if you will see the green color, it is again a flying, already flying aircraft with our Indian Air Force. It is the Kiran. Since the technical life of the Kiran has been coming to an end, so we, within our HEL, there is a feeling that since structurally it is proven, aerodynamically it is much better. Our customers are very happy with this product. So let us give them another proposal of converting it into a UAVs because they still have 100 plus Kiran aircrafts in a good condition with our customers. So if those are converted into UAVs, which can be helpful in again collecting the real time data surveillance along the sea coast. So this will be very helpful for the Navy, Coast Guards, as well as the Indian Air Force. And the leftmost bottom is the Hale UAV. It is a totally new aircraft, which on the conceptual studies and now preliminary studies are undergoing very soon. If any, uh, once the inboard studies and the wind tunnel testing is done, it will be taken up for the physical prototype manufacture. So uh, now how we study our customer requirements, how we generate our conceptual things, understanding the uh, defense force requirements. So it is again a beautiful case, which I am trying to cover it now. Coming, uh, this talks about the army requirement. So there was a, uh, in fact, long pending requirement of a vertical takeoff and landing UAV to carry cargo at high altitude, which has been already published by the Army Design Bureau. Now, simply saying it as a statement was again a big challenge because how much altitude the load has to be taken up and what has to be the speed. All these things we have our existing project like which we already served the Indian Air Forces and some already flying UAVs of this class. So the mission requirement of Army here was to provide a last mile logistical connectivity at a high altitude for their troops by transporting goods from an altitude as, as high as 14,000 feet to 18,000 feet. So now you can correlate this requirement with the Leh and Ladakh case, which already I uh, already discussed at the starting of this webinar. 14,000 to 18,000 feet holder is the highest battlefield in the entire world. Now, the climatic conditions are different, the enemies are different, and the terrain, the land area is totally different. It is not a plain, it's not grassy terrain. It is the hilly terrain, rocky terrain, where the landing takeoff is a big challenge, a big nightmare. So this was the requirement, and then of course, the payload requirement, which finally came from them was 20 kg. So this 20 kg can be again distributed among food, their fuel, some ammunition, and some medical aid to their bases, which are located at high as well as very long untouched areas. Now, since we got these requirements, then automatically our design team and the marketing team started considering the counterparts. So here we came around two, three aircrafts, which were already flying and they were converted. One is Camcopter, Shivel Camcopter from Austria. Then we have a Saab 
Skeldar from the Sweden, and then Augusta Westland, Hero Italy. Now, when we do a mock up of 200 kg RUAV, we already put up a model during the last Aero India show just to attract, just to get the attention of our defense forces. So, at that point of time, once we started discussing with them, negotiating with them, they said, yes, this could be a product which we need, which can satisfy our requirement. So, the model which we displayed at the Aero India show was matching with the counterparts, that is Augusta Westland Hero from Italy. Now, this is a snapshot. This is how we planned our development cycle. The payload is roughly taken as 20 to 30 kgs. Altitude was decided as 14,000 feet at the base configuration, that is the initial operation clearance. Now it will hover, it will climb, then it will slightly cruise, then from D to E, these are basically the checkpoints where it will descend, and then it will hover and finally land off vertically. With while landing, it will again definitely have a zero payload because it would have already dropped the load at the desired location. Now, if you will see the current helicopters which we have already delivered to them, they are of typically four and a half to five ton. This class where the requirement is bare minimum the operational requirement of high altitude and the weight category remains the same. So this is what we are already work is undergoing and very soon the prototype will be there to go for the physical and the flight testing. Now, having said that done, a lot of new technology has to be incorporated because any lightweight machine which has to fly at big altitude, you need to cover up new materials, which can really help to enable our aerospace structures. So this slide talks about how till now we have moved from a basic leather and wood structures to aluminum, then composites, fiberglasses, and then finally smart materials where we are incorporating uh, we are synchronizing the advantages of both composites, metallic, as well as thermoset composites. And of course, the ceramics, because the new trends have shown high strength in ceramics. Now, not only from the structure point of view, if you have to design the vehicles for your defense forces, it has to be at par, at class with the existing one because uh, it should have a win-win situation for both. After taking, after ending the product from us, they should not feel that, the, of course, the similar product is flying at a different country, which is much better in performance, which is much better in cost. So likewise, a lot of parallel studies and concurrent design has to follow. So here, the different departments which has to work on the next way of achievement is communication surveillance, guidance and controls. Then, of course, this is an era of sensors. If we have been using sensors in the vehicles on roads, why can't the sensors which are used for the aerial vehicles should be smart enough? So the real-time capturing of the data, real-time thermal imaging will happen only if you have advanced sensors fitted to your aircraft. Then, in this era of information technology, so much of data which is getting collected, you need to filter and give it a shape which is very easy to transmit to the ground station. So, the real time data filtering it and then transmitting it huge volume to the, your field, this all again requires a lot of studies. So, all the things together, and then of course the electronic systems where research team has to be really
technology. So today our typical structures do has rivets to connect one individual member with the side member. So this typically shows how the profile of a stringer looks like, how the edge sealing is done, how the surface sealing is done, and finally external skin comes from the top. So all these things combined together with the rivet makes a very robust structure. But again, we are losing in terms of the weight. There is a weight penalty. The more the pieces are connected together, the more the surface finishes, sealing, paint finish, with the nuts, bolts, it makes your structure rigid, but more heavy. So anything which you are flying in the aircraft, which is bulky and heavy, with loose, will definitely lose its performance. Now coming to the mass structures, which we are proposing and we are working today for tomorrow approach is integral fuselage design. Here, the stringer will not be separately connected. Either it could be an extruded one or it could be co-bonded or co-welded with the outer skin. So this is achievable, but only thing is your traditional way of working on jigs, fixtures will be totally changed. This will be made as a small, small modules and these small modules or the small assembly will finally get attached into the coupling stage. So this drastically reduces the weight. This drastically reduces the snacks, the issues, the time which used to be spent in connecting one member with the another and doing a lot of inspection to get that part ready and cleared. This will be drastically reduced. So a teeth joint, I have covered it in one of the picture. The joint becomes simpler, the number of parts becomes reduced, the assembly looks much better and much more traceability is achieved. Traceability means you are able to trace a small sub-assembly because it comprises of less number of parts. So as an example, I have just shown a T-joint, a butt joint, how it makes smaller reliable sub-assembly. And this sub-assembly goes and connects to the parent assembly to make the entire structure ready. So all said, then done. Let us also talk about the outlook, a kind of a summary which we think these autonomous vehicles will be the future, but where we stand as of now. We have seen in previous sections that there is a lot of scope for UAV's application and adoption in India. But there are very few players in the market that can really provide us services and product for our military use. It is very easy to demonstrate a small drone which can take your parcel delivered to the customer in a big city. But the hardships and the challenges for the military use is entirely different. That is the reason there are very less private participants who can be invited or who could be used for any collaboration by our government. Coming to the next changes, the regulation. We have already seen the regulations need to be really very stringent and healthy, but they should be adopted very at a lesser timeline. They shouldn't provide any obstacle to the new companies from investing, coming forward and working for our military forces. And uh, the third point which I considered is equally important is importing the UAVs or UAS to keep up the demand with the world. Defense force because it is very easy. You simply spend the money, you simply spend your forex, you see some item from the international market and straight away purchase it. But the hardships, the struggle comes after its service timeline is due. We will not be able to have a proper maintenance, service, and the repair of the UAV. So at a time, this cannot be possible as there are countries which have already put 
this technology of drone on an export blacklist. So even though there are challenges which our defense forces may have to face to get it service and maintenance, but already the international companies are not at all allowing their advanced technologies which is working behind the drones to reveal it to sell it to the third nation. Uh, if we get into the details, there are so many technologies, I can call it as a radar technology, I can call it as a stealth technologies which nobody wants to share because it is a patent, their copyright technology. So considering those things, our defense CPSC has to embrace the UAV market with both the fixed wing and the rotary wing products. Because this is the right time. We need to invest our own money, our own resources to get into this technology. Otherwise, again, already we are lagging behind the Western nations. Further, we will go back by another four to five years. Then there are strategies like mergers, acquisitions and joint ventures, which are currently required to broaden on the product base and increase its domestic and international presence. Suppose within our HL, we are very good in our propositions and structures. Then other con company like DRDO or ISRO, they are very good in aerodynamics. They are very good in avionics. So this is a time when we can integrate together, pull out our resources, pull out our minds and work for common product, which could be delivered, and which is much more reliable, equal in safety aspects, just like our international competition. So the, our customers, which are basically Army, Navy, Air Force, they will be very happy to get this product because not only the cost, the after service, the after repair also will be very much increased. And then adoption of the UAVs, that is unmanned aerial systems, is increasing in India. And it is projected that the value of industry and the market would be around US dollar 885.7 million, while the global market size will touch US dollar 21.47 yeah. But this figure comprises of both minute logistics as well as commercial logistics. So this is the market area which is growing day by day. And this is the right time. We all should try to enter and take our customers' confidence with us to deliver them the product which can provide the logistics at their last borderline. The UV market across the military sector is equally growing at a fast pace. At present, if I'll see the bar chart, it is at a cumulative annual growth rate of 12%. In a developing country like India, if it is currently at 12%, so we can anticipate it growing at a exponential growth rate and achieving the double figure target by another two to three years. So the outlook looks very positive. The future belongs to us since in India, we do have those mind, we do have those technologies and our software is better than none in the entire international community. So what we feel and we need to work right now is to work on the common platforms inviting the private industries as well as the academic institutions where we can provide and test and flying test the UAVs which can be useful for our customers. So uh, if anybody with this, I think I can put up for any questions from our audience. Anybody has any doubts or they want to have some further? Oh, yes, sir. Hello? Yeah. Yes, sir. We have a doubt. So, yes. actually, we have uh, UAVs like um, from smaller one to larger one. But why we can't go with uh, like insects, uh, insect types, small insect like flying object? Yes. By using nanotechnology, now the process is going on? Yes, correct. 
the nanotechnology product has to be proven first it has to be tested yeah. very rigorously it has to be uh, used first as a pilot test on some platform so right now within our hcl and within our uh, msmes we don't have that platform where we can fit that nanotechnology part or nanotechnology system and do the test so gradually once this technology is proven we can use it for the real time flying machine in the drone okay sir okay sir sir one more question yeah. so after take off the our almond aerial vehicle in some in case of some issues it will cut off we can gain reconnect it we can reconnect it yeah uh, there is a, always a redundancy which we uses in all the flying machines apart mm. from the gps that is the okay. global position system we have other control modes that is a, a other controller it is basically a local network which okay, works okay. which mm-hmm. works to safely land the flying machine back to the base otherwise you will lose the control and the flying machine will go and hit some rough area or maybe some uh of this so to okay. safely land it back you need to have a parallel system in place okay sir by the ground parallel system yes sir sir ஒரு Mm-hmm. within our company we are going to propose and uh, again uh, next year there is an aero india show which is coming up so we will have our own products lined up and we will have lot of productions with the customer so there the usage of the uavs for their logistic supply where they can use the uavs to deliver their items for their forward post at the border areas we will try to discuss and uh clear of doubts and the questions in the mind so okay yes sir now a little it's okay i feel ha it's okay sir currently i just yeah i just shared five of the products which we are working as of now under this uh, three are totally new aircraft that is mini uav hail that is a high altitude long endurance it is the leftmost bottom uh, aircraft and then we have uh, rustam rustam is basically a male carry aircraft male is a very altitude long endurance aircraft having a propeller okay. so these three are new but remaining two are a helicopter and a kiran aircraft which we are converting the already existing flying machines as a must uav so i can uh, you can share my mail id with all the audiences i can give more details on the our products as well as already flying uav which uh, indian army and indian air force has purchased from israel and from uh, us sure sir definitely yeah. my mail id is uh, deepak kehri Eight zero eighty at gmail dot com. Okay. I'm available for all the doubts, for all the questions. Mm. You can always reach to me. Okay, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a very pleasant moment. The presentation went quietly, knowledgeable, and very nice. It's all because of you, sir. Oh, It's thank you. Awesome. And in this webinar, I think we gained a lot from you. we who are okay. in the meeting it is very helpful to our future generation youngsters thank you so much sir for participation in the event and we come from yeah. our wings of aero as well
thank you so much sir once again thank you so much thank you thank you rajeshwari for the nice combination and thank you the team from the your aero team who is working day and night to bring out the latest technologies and sharing this knowledge to all the audiences okay sir thank you again thank you sir shall we win the pso